apologies for that technical difficulties. We're back. Uh, we switched out the mics and we're good to go. So yes, and without any further ado, um, I'm just going to get into the poem. It's called Talk Ugly. Um, it's dedicated to um, anybody who has ever lost someone. Um, and that's far too many of us. Um, the last time I saw you alive, I wish I would have talked ugly to you, said, put the straw down. No, I don't want to take another line. I should be writing them. My friend, you are a composer of music and magic. Instruct your limbs to serve a purpose greater than self-indulgence. Do not be fooled into thinking your pain has sharper teeth than anyone else's. I had a chance, but said nothing because I was high. This is how I got started, a ball of jack and a mirror, memories and scissors, dreams drenched in ether, sliced by razors, potential roll like $20 bills, numbing the feeling on the tip of my tongue that I or this tongue should be serving a greater purpose. In the last ditch attempt at self-assessment, I decided to look at my life through the eyes of loved ones where they see everything, especially the ugly. From years of drug use, from lying with to lying to angels, friends I had forsaken, taking so much more than I had given. I had streamlined self-centeredness into a science. But there was a righteousness there, a willingness to craft this illness through alchemy and poetry into a sear stone, but honestly, how could I speak ugly to you when I was yet to speak it to myself? In these nightmares of hindsight, there is no poetry, no alliterations to soften the blow. Some realities have no simile. Truth is like truth. How could I form my lips to call your suicide a tragedy when I left you alone in that room? Kept company by narcotics and a thousand ghosts draped in your disappointments. I can only imagine all the voices you heard all but mine. Smear makeup onto disgust if you must. Trust the truth is seldom pretty, but she is always beautiful. It is in times like these that I need you to please talk ugly to me. My pain needs it. Too many times we caress sadness when it needs to be shaken. Torn from its place of comfort, forced to grow wings to survive. Don't just tell me I can grow up and be whatever I want. Tell me that whatever I want better be something I'm willing to achieve, that dreams will dissipate under the weight of addiction, and that there is a distinct difference between living like a rock star and actually being one. Sometimes, no matter how many poems you've written, you're just a cokehead and a poser. Fear not. We are all divinely flawed individuals, perfectly ugly. There's no point hiding behind pretty lies. We are the sum of the scars that hold together the remainder of our pretty pieces. The last time I saw you alive, I wish I would have talked ugly to you. It would have been the most beautiful thing I never said. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. You get my catch my breath for a minute. Um, as I said, we've been going across the state for a little over a month now. As Joseph referenced, we've lost a lot of people. Some of us sitting on these panels know people who we've lost during this time frame. <clears throat> so we're living in hard times for sure. One of the reasons that APNC wanted to do this was not to show you a fabulous and profoundly important movie, but to kick off <clears throat> North Carolina, where we're at now to where we want to be going and to have some of those hard conversations that I think it's so easy to avoid. It's so easy to avoid having the hard conversations where you have to show up and be vulnerable and say, listen, this is us. We own part of this. We could be doing something better. I don't know what the answer is. Nobody knows what the answer is. Let's figure it out together. It's hard to have those conversations. And so that has really been the purpose and intent of, of all of this across the state. Um, COVID has been hard on everybody. Um, it's been hard on our frontline service workers working in the field. It's been hard on our young people. It's been hard on our parents. It's been hard on our families. It's been hard on really everyone. It's been hard on our service systems who <clears throat> are grappling with 
rapidly changing things that they've never had to deal with before, the pandemic, anticipating what the policy change needs to be next, figuring out how to braid all these funding streams together in the case of our General Assembly and what's the best policies for providing services in this weird space that we've never been. Um, we wanted to bring all that to bear uh, now and, and to drive those conversations in a way that, that really underpin us as a state being able to shape what we want public policy to look like and how we want to drive better health policy in North Carolina so that we don't lose any more people than we have to. Um, so that's really why we did this today, or not today, but the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole time. Um, I think this is a unique period of time. Um, we will have a harm reduction friend uh, showing up with us soon who had a flat tire, but harm reduction in this space thankfully has finally got some of the, the attention and kudos that has been scratching and clawing towards for a really long time. And so that's a unique moment in time for us to, again, present ourselves in that vulnerable space when we're coming in and saying, oh, I don't like that. That's a bad idea. Oh, that's wrong. Maybe we don't want to do that. Oh, that's scary. To, to start with asking ourselves, okay, we can sit with this discomfort. We can sit here in a place of leadership and vulnerability, and, and we will all come out of that together. Um, <clears throat> we are using the these venues. You all got a survey, you see a survey. Um, when we are talking with our state leaders and our legislators, we aren't talking on behalf of, of our opinion. We are talking on behalf of the state of North Carolina and what our people and communities need. So please fill out that survey. I can guarantee you that that is how we are shaping and driving our messaging forward. Um, our, our leaders want to hear from us. Um, they have been working really hard to my point of it's really easy to sort of say, here's the problem, there's the problem. Our leaders have been working really hard for, for a really long time. They want to hear what we have to say. And so though that survey, these conversations will be used, they will be shared with our, our General Assembly as well as all of our state leaders. Um, we did not set the panel with those because we want to hear specifically from communities. We want to know how this is experienced, how this is felt in an intimate way in the community level because Boone is very different than Fayetteville. And what's important in those areas, there might be some common threads, but the nuances are different. And so that's what we wanted to, to bring to bear. So that's a little bit about why we did it. Um, and, and of course, a plug for um, not being shy. Please help us. If you have something to say about what needs to be better, share it with us so that we can amplify that on your behalf. And now I'm gonna switch over and um, introduce everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Potter. I'm the Executive Director of Addiction Professionals of North Carolina. Happy to be here um, and thankful for this experience. And I'm gonna ask our panelists to just introduce themselves. Um, many of you have, have seen their bios already, but go to you, Sarah. I'm Sarah Howe. I'm with Third Horizon Strategies. We are a healthcare advisory firm that has the uh, honor um, and privilege of showing this film around the country. Um, and our, the producer of the film is one of our partners at the firm. I have worked in the behavioral health field for 20 plus years as an advocate, mostly in the Midwest, and I support APNC in the work they do as well. Hi, I'm Jane Clark. I am a consultant with Care Consulting Group. And what we do is serve nationally communities, particularly minority and rural communities, build their capacity to address these hard issues. We do a lot of focus on building communities' abilities as well as building uh, agencies' abilities. So we do free grant writing with the specific focus of helping these communities address these kinds of issues. I've been in behavioral health for almost 20 years with a specialty in prevention, and this is always more than work to me. It's passion. I'm Julie Capshaw. Um, I am a student at UNC Charlotte. Um, I am also part of the collegiate recovery program here. Um, I am a grad student um, in the counseling program. I am also personally in recovery. Um, I have seven years sober. Um, <laughs> um, and I also have worked in behavioral health for a couple of years. So thank you for having me. 
Hi, my name is Joseph Green. Um, you saw the movie, maybe uh, you read the bio, so I will tell you something you don't know about me uh, is that I have an eight-year-old son and his name is Henry, and I have a two-year-old son and his name is August. Hi, I'm Lauren Kessner, and um, I work for Center for Prevention Services. I'm the Associate Director for Harm Reduction, and I oversee Queen City Harm Reduction. Um, I am a person with lived experience, and I have worked across the framework of recovery, prevention, and harm reduction, and I'm thrilled to be on this panel. Thank you for having me. Am I being too quiet? <laughs> Okay, well, let's just get the conversation started um, by talking about impressions uh, from the film, kind of what stood out to you, what messages resonated, um, what scenes are such powerful stories in there, um, such powerful characters uh, in that film, not characters, but characters uh, in the sense of um, providing really color to the film in, in the way of that storytelling. Um, so what stood out to you as you think back um, on the film? It's hard to watch when you have family or friends with that lived experience mm -hmm. and hard to watch even if you don't. It's, it's the, the truth, like Joseph was saying, the truth can be harsh, but it's always beautiful if we're willing to face it. Yeah, I'll jump on that. I think that the movie did a wonderful job of juxtaposing the hope to the problem. Um, like everybody who you would get to experience in the movie has some form of lived experience and has learned something from that lived experience and is doing something based off of that lived experience. And while there is a lot of it that's hard to look at, if you can, you'll start seeing the solution in, in it if you're willing to face it. Yeah, I would say that the arts component actually stood out the most for me because um, I'm an illustrator by trade and a lot of the work that we do with um, harm reduction and prevention and with young people, um, we started um, doing a lot of holistic workshops. So hearing the poetry piece and um, I can't remember her name, but the Sunshine Lady. Roz. 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 Um, I loved how she talked about um, the arts on the street and how you would see woven material in between the fences and things like that. And I thought it was really beautiful that the color she was, you know, offering to these communities through these really rare and creative outlets. So I just, I think probably hit me the most out of the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I agree. I think it was painful to watch um, just because I think that it, you know, addiction is a painful subject. Um, for anyone who's witnessed it or um, has experienced it and you know anyone who struggles it's hard to watch another human being suffer um, but I did find hope in the way that different people address recovery you know um, and you know it wasn't like this is the only way it was people are in pain how can we support one another and hear some ideas about how to do that mm -hmm. yeah and it wasn't just one idea right it was yeah. a lot of different ideas from right. a lot mm -hmm. of different places which to your point earlier is pretty awesome to see happening on a macro level mm -hmm. right. i think the timing there were a lot of pieces of that movie that i think the timing were so right there there's so many films out there that tackle addiction mm -hmm. from documentaries to mainstream mm -hmm. this came out right at our moment, so to speak, we were, were talking about funding changing, you know, funding increasing and a discussion on policy. And you know, this past Tuesday, we heard the president speak the words parity in a state of the union, which has we've not had before. And so the, the, the intersection of this movie and the work that we're doing in these discussions is that this is our moment. And it, when you get done and you see the end of it, which I think is at the end is your other poem, it leaves you with that hope, that resilience. So, so where do we take this? What do we do? How do we move it forward? And that, that I think is what it, it grabs you and asks you, so now what, what's next? Mm -hmm. I liked the, the, the reframing for me was really important because <clears throat> working in the field, especially when you do for so long. It's so easy to be focused on this problem and this problem and this detail and that detail. 
And sometimes it's hard to, to pick your head up and step back, like, wait a minute, I need to really shift. I need a whole paradigm shift on how I am thinking about that. And so I thought, you know, that moment in the film that, that really essentially said, we need to think about this entirely differently mm -hmm. now than we ever have was, was really important to me. And then I thought it was really beautiful that, that we saw the progression of people who are having challenges with, with the system and with getting claims paid and, mm -hmm. and having those barrier ac access barriers. And then we saw that turn into tangible policy change that is happening still now and still benefiting us going forward. So that progression to me, I thought was really important for us. Um, and I thought the timing again was, was perfect on that. So. And you said what's next, um, mm -hmm. which came up in the movie. And I'm just thinking, you know, I've never had this experience on a virtual panel, but you know, I love this conversation about collaborative care and hearing from the community. And I think what sets North Carolina apart from a lot of other states is how many people with lived experience have been invited to the table over the course of the last, you know, 10 or even 15 years now. And so, you know, that's really been awesome to see. And I think it's just, you know, we need to peel back more layers. We need to bring more people to the table. And this is a really neat opportunity to hear from the community because essentially you guys are the ones who need to decide and, and tell us how you want to move forward. Okay? Absolutely. There's almost it's a simultaneous relief and heartbreak to know that systems issues affect all of us mm -hmm. and of what's next is is the recognition that we're not alone, whether it's as individuals struggling with with our own challenges, you know, day to day life or collectively as communities as parents as family members um, to, to band together to make the kind of community change that is necessary for there to be policy change, necessary for systems change to happen. One of the tenets of prevention, it's, it's a sad one, is that it usually takes a crisis in a community for action to happen. And a silver lining for the pandemic is it's that crisis that we finally have a nation recognizing the value of prevention, treatment, recovery, whether it's substance use or mental, mental wellness. Um, this is our time. We're not alone, and it's on us to take action together. It's mm -hmm. this is our time. So just like the film does, let's bring it back to the the human focus um, for a minute here on campus in Charlotte. So mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about what Charlotte does. You can see Charlotte does to promote students, help students who are struggling, um, help help support recovery, um, what do you see happening at campus? Um, well, first of all, the collegiate recovery program um, is awesome. Um, I was nervous the first time I went to an event because I felt like um, I was too old. I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm 30 years old. I don't know if I, I don't know. Um, but it was, it felt very inclusive and not exclusive. And I think that that was important for me. Um, and as far as, you know, having with the collegiate recovery program, they provide counseling services. Um, so, you know, not only are you surrounding yourself with people who are with you um, and, wanting to recover with you, but you're also given um, an opportunity to work with a certified substance use specialist. Um, and then you're given the opportunity to give back also. We have volunteer events, like I think it was today or yesterday, um, taking volunteers to work um, on campus for HIV testing. And um, so, uh, you know, opportunities to give back in other ways also. Um, and just to have a sense of community because in college, um, whether you're in grad school, undergrad, and especially at a like, big university, it's easy, I think, to feel lost. And I know in the film, I forget who it was, but someone said on in the film that um, addiction, um, 
or like one of the qualifiers of addiction is loneliness. Um, and I think, you know, at UNC Charlotte to have a program and even a special room on campus, because there's a CRC, CRC room where we can go and like study or hang out with one another to feel safe on campus um, and to feel like you can belong somewhere um, is really beautiful, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. And so let's let's expand it out to, to the Charlotte area um, and talk about what's happening here. So what we would like to do is to highlight some of the good things that are happening. I mentioned the differences between Fayetteville and Boone, for example. There, there are um, things that are happening here in Charlotte that are really great and really important, but in Greenville, they might not have heard of that or know that it's happening here or know that there is a connection point or know that, hey, Lauren is doing something really cool in Charlotte. I can connect with her and get that going here. So, so what things are happening that you feel are either innovative or really sound, um, strong, important work, either across prevention, treatment, recovery, harm reduction, or just at the community level sort of connection that's happening? I mean, I can certainly speak to grassroots programming. I, um, I think that what's really interesting is the um, everybody's working really collaboratively. Um, funding streams are being united. People are partnering. Task forces have been developed. Um, it doesn't always have a huge stretch depending on, you know, I don't know, I think just, you know, task force to council to committee. I mean, everybody has a little bit of a different lens, but no, it's been really cool to see people working on a level that is just for the people, you know, by the people. Mm -hmm. And then what we do often, and I think why Queen City Harm Reduction has a great reach here in Charlotte is because we do a lot of peer distribution. So we engage with people um, and people who use drugs, who also care about themselves and care about their loved ones and care about their community. And we have volunteers and we provide stipends and support for individuals to go out and just send the message of how to take care and how to be safe and here's some great and essential supplies and that's peer-to-peer -peer. and we have a lot of overdose reversals as a result of peer-to-peer -peer distribution so that is really authentic grassroots stuff that's happening in charlotte and they're all connected with a bunch of different resources so we're very familiar with caring we're very familiar with Anuvia, McLeod, um, Charlotte Community Health Clinic, the various universities, because there's a lot of different educational opportunities here in Charlotte. And we um, really get to see an awesome nexus kind of come together and fan back out on the ground. Mm -hmm. One of the best things with harm reduction is nothing about us without us. So we really make sure it stays on a ground level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to add to that by saying there's a real commitment to equity in Charlotte. And I think a large part of that is because we have this massive influx of people moving here. It's over 100 new people a day. It's the last stat I heard. And it's evidenced by this challenging housing market. There's just not enough places for people to live. If you're at one end of the spectrum, it's really difficult. If you're at the other end, it's still really difficult. But it's brought to the forefront in Charlotte this need for equity as a priority. And we see that in a lot of these community programs like Lauren was describing. We see it in these panel discussions. You see it in conversations at a coffee shop. And in today's world, that needs to be part of the groundwater of every conversation we do for health and wellness um, and just, just work life in general. It, it's, it's happening here in that regard. And I think we could set up models for that and how to you know, expand that. You know, what would that look like in other communities in North Carolina? What would it look like in other communities across the country? We've got a and you mentioned it earlier, I think as a result of these shifts and groups and people coming together, we've been challenged with having those really tough conversations. Mm -hmm. Like it's so unavoidable at this point. We have to talk about class. We have to talk about race. We have to talk about ethnicity. And we really need to understand how the scales are balancing and, and where the leverage is. So um, it's been really cool, but really, really tough to what you said before. Yeah. Um, but I guess, you know, as 
I don't know, being who I am, I've always been very confrontational. So while it's really awkward and really icky, you also leave some of these conversations feeling so refreshed, even if nothing changes in that moment. And even though you know it's going to take time and like this is all very preliminary, we've been meeting so many cool groups who are again, collaborating on HIV work, syringe access mm -hmm. work, primary prevention work, you know, all of it, it's, it's really awesome to see. So um, I just hope people keep diving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And when you mentioned the collegiate recovery program, I've said this to Sarah several times and you've done work around the country. I mean, this North Carolina should really be commended for the work in the collegiate recovery space. It is the strongest state for collegiate recovery. So that is something when we talk about what's next is continuing that movement, looking at areas of the state where it might not be yet. And how do we continue to build that and ensure that the strength stays in the community for those programs? Because it's it's really something that you don't see often. And it's very it's a resilient program mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. changes your life on a campus. Mm -hmm. I think people just don't know about it too, mm -hmm. you know, um, because, you know, addiction and things and mental health is so stigmatized that people carry that weight alone. And it's not, you know, something that people often just walk around, you know, on college campuses, like, Hey, I'm struggling with addiction. Who yeah. wants to talk about that with me? You know, right. it's not it's not something that happens a lot. Um, so I think, you know, especially in Charlotte, I really, because I moved here from Atlanta in August, I'm one of those new people. I like that I see like around Charlotte treatment places advertised as treatment places um, because other cities keep those places um, hidden in a sense mm -hmm. or anonymous like you know at the front of the business um, but here it's like hey this is for recovery mm -hmm. and I was like wow like that's cool you know to yeah. destigmatize that mm -hmm. it's um this is this is such a value in having it up front so that people don't feel like it's something that they have to go in the back door for. Right, right. Um, for example, right before I came into this conversation, I had a phone call from a former student who uh, was looking for help. She's at college. And I was like, do you have a recovery um, program on your campus? And she went straight to the internet. She's like, oh yeah, they meet on Wednesdays at six o'clock. I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna call you every day until next Wednesday where we're gonna make sure that you at least go and find that space. Um, and that is both a victory, but it's also like, if she didn't know me, why I don't go to that school, you know, what can we, what can we continue to do to support bringing it out and, and showing it? And I love the idea of like, it, that's what it says on the door, right? Like you don't have to like Google the meeting to find where it is. So that is a beautiful thing. I think for people to keep in mind that it's it, it, all the things that we talk about in our doctor's office, right? We don't hide that it's the doctor's office. There's no difference in the help and the healthiness and the wellness that we're seeking in those spaces. So that's a really lovely thing. Right. And I do think we are, we are lucky um, as a state <clears throat> because North Carolina has put such a long-standing investment in raising up leadership in recovery um, in Putting, fund, putting our money where our mouth is really in, in the funding space to make sure that that happens specifically in the re collegiate recovery programs. Um, what, we, what we are seeing now, many years later, is some of the fruits of that. When the pandemic started, there were a lot of students at the college level, especially that, that got sort of ripped out of their place. They maybe got sent back to a hard place to live that they tried to leave. Uh, it was a really chaotic time, and and so we saw our, our collegiate recovery students really stepping in. There was a light bulb moment that our collegiate recovery students said to us, wait a minute, we're seeing a lot of young people, teenagers even, who are not in school right now, they should be in online school, out doing things they're not supposed to be doing. And then also a lot of our peers are struggling with things that we can help 
we have learned a healthier way to live. We've learned how to deal with these kinds of things. And, and most students have not had that kind of experiential yeah. learning and we can help. And so I thought that was a, it's not quantifiable, um, but it's, it's priceless for sure um, to have seen that, so. I think for the longest time, particularly on the college campuses, we just said, oh, that can't possibly work to have a recovery program on a college campus. It's too hard, so we just won't do it. And instead, this program has grown up saying, no, absolutely not. Yes, we can. We can do it, and we can bring the entire community with us. And that's been the hallmark of this, and it's really shown other colleges what they can do and how you can have a healthy campus and what that means. And I think the, continu the prevention continuum also is connected in that. And that's the other piece is you don't necessarily have to be in recovery to be part of that program and to support the program and to understand that there are prevention areas as well that we can connect to. So that's been the other piece of it. Welcome. Hello. I think one of the, Sorry, I put a damper on some of the very uplifting things here, but you know, one of the things we saw a lot of on, you know, a young people, you know, with young people even younger than college and adults, is especially with the displacement, jobs lost, pandemic. I don't need to say much more. Um, and I know that collegiate recovery did make some waves in increasing uh, more access to mutual aid support, which was really awesome to see. And you saw a lot of people come together going back to that conversation with collaborative care. You know, provide more buprenorphine access. You know, really, you know, you've seen a lot of policy work happen around methadone. And I saw collegiate recovery spaces open their arms there too. But we also saw a lot of people get um, removed, hit a lot of hiccups and barriers in accessing um, really any kind of care. I mean, I, I've, I, this is hard to say, but I hope I can articulate it right between recovery and prevention, there's a lot of gray area. Mm -hmm. And I always love to look at the healthcare continuum as harm reduction, and sorry, it's a little biased, but harm reduction, <laughs> you know, being like the solar system um, rings connecting all the planets. Mm -hmm. And I see the planets as housing and prevention yeah. mm -hmm. and recovery and all of that. And so through what I've seen over the last three years, especially is people really have relied on, you know, a harm reduction level to open these doors for people who were just getting bombarded and getting moved all over the place. And they just couldn't get access to medication, couldn't even stay at encampments, couldn't stay in hotels. We saw urban ministries uptown and um, Tent City get entirely evacuated, mm -hmm. um, which was devastating. And I just, you know, for all of the, uh, there was so much positivity and I'm, I hope I'm making sense here. Um, but that needs-based care, that needs-based attention was so nice to see come to the, conversation and yes. see being brought to action and on a college level on a, even a youth and prevention level I mean some of the material that um, our programs were and do continue to work with I mean we just have softened a lot of the message because people just needed to hear some hope mm -hmm. yeah that's true so I want to welcome you thank you for um, for joining sorry about your your oh, uh, okay. car trouble <laughs> yeah. um do you want to take a minute to introduce yourself? Um, sure. I'm, I'm Joe, Joe Lewis, and I'm glad to be here. I'm not sure what this is, if I'm prompts. <laughs> I don't want to take too much time either. Okay. I'll be being late. No, no prompts. Um, jump, feel free to jump into the conversation. Um, so I, I appreciate your, you know, raising up some of the harder parts to talk about um, in, in the system. I think, you know, you mentioned we all kind of walk around with, um, kind of things that we carry with us that feel shameful or, or hard to talk about. I think that's exactly the things that as professionals, we do the same thing. And, and, and I think if we're gonna get to a place of even being able to funnel crisis services and funds to where they really need to be in the ways that they really need to, to be done, we have to do that. You know, and that's kind of what I was trying to get at the start, sort of coming into a conversation from a vulnerable space, because that's hard to do as someone who's been working in, the, in this, putting your blood, sweat, and tears in it for so long to, to see there's so many problems, there's still so many problems, so many people hurting still. Um, 
I think for us in North Carolina, we, we do have that extra layer of difficulty, which is there's of course the pandemic, there are more people moving here still. I mean, we've had such an influx of people moving here and it just, it keeps continuing and continuing. And, and there's clearly a workforce shortage. We've seen people burn out left and right over this last year. We've seen lots of increases in use in, in ways that, you know, unfortunately we have had people in a healthy place that, that are not in such a healthy place now. We've, like I said, seeing people leaving the field and that's compounded by so many people moving in. So, so we're experiencing those crises in the workforce, just there, there are waiting lists like we have not seen for a really, really long time. And so for us, sort of carrying that is hard. We, we saw that from, from Roz when, when she was in the film talking about um, that being a hard weight, a, a hard thing to carry. And so I, I, Lauren, I know that you, you do a good bit of harm reduction. Joe, you too. Can we just, it, it's easy to see that in the harm reduction space, right? Because you're, you're doing that direct work and, and there are going to be people that, 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 that we can't, we can't save. And that is a hard thing to carry. Can you guys just touch on that kind of within the context of everything is really hard and, and then in, a, in, in this space, also having that extra weight of, of carrying, carrying that, uh, that with you just as a person who keeps getting up every day and keeps going in there. It's, you know, it's hard to start, um, to start. it's, I don't know, I, I myself went through um, like a long-term uh, recovery program some years back and uh, it was helpful, um, but being, going through that, there was so much uh, loss and so many friends that were there one day and went, weren't, weren't the next and we would, uh, it was in Raleigh and we'd be um, lobbying, doing policy work and like um, kind of getting the worst. So there was definitely the, um, I experienced the burnout. I experienced a lot of, uh, just jaded like views of, of of the systems and how they're really like working and who they're working for. Um, um, and just to be just to be frank, because I just I, that's that's me. And it, it just seems like um, folks didn't care too much until a certain um, you know a certain uh, demographic was was starting to be a little bit affected. It hit too close to home for some of the policymakers, and then they would you know develop these things, but. Um, so all of that in itself was just, just kind of trauma in a, in a sense and triggering. Um, for me, like even like today, so with the flat tires and all the things that I've that experienced in um, the therapy, mindful, mindfulness, mindful meditation practices and things like that sound kind of cliche, but they really do kind of help you just ground yourself. Because like you said, I mean, I, without naming the names, it, it's North Carolina, we're, we're familiar, but some friends of mine that, you know, directing like, you know, large organizations focused in harm reduction, struggle in and out, you know, themselves. And that's, a, that's another thing that they're like your mentor or, you know, somebody that, that you look up to. Um, it's difficult. It's really, um, for me, it's a spiritual thing. It's, um, it's a, just a, the, the knowing that, uh, that it worked for, it for, work, for, worked for me and like folks didn't give all the way up and so like I just kind of carry that with me when I when I go um I make sure that I uh, remind myself that I don't have the answers answers per se um I hate to like show up to a space and just you know try to give advice even like it's really just like meeting people where they are because a lot of times if somebody's not ready they're just not ready and they're not gonna they're not gonna um respond too well so it's just literally like are, are you hungry you know those kinds of things and just kind of like meeting them where they are and it's um it helps even when it's not going to work out even when they're not going to stay even if they're going to leave or sometimes they they od the next day um it just helps me like just know that i just approached it with um a human that human level connection um helps um, and just acceptance acceptance of like knowing that some of us um, might make it, some of us might not, um, but I'm committed to, to, to always trying.
Um, I think it was really heavy. Um, it wasn't anything new, you know, these were things that all existed pre pandemic that just hemorrhaged. Yeah. So we just saw worlds collide and we were like, thanks for noticing. That's how I felt. Yeah. Um, and it was nice and it was relieving because, you know, support was coming, but no, I mean, like these things and these very racist and classist issues and systemic and structural barriers have existed forever. And in Char Charlotte in particular, you know, we still practice gatekeeping and we nice. redraw our district lines like Jesus every two months. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's challenging. I mean, it's really a lot to keep up with. So, I mean, apart from just living in the wildfire all your life and then working in it, which I know all of us relate to, um, you know, I also, the resilience of people who use drugs blows me away. It just blows me away. Yeah. And while we see so much loss, we saw so many people and so many peer groups come together and just rally. And that was probably the most rewarding part of the last three years for me as far as my work goes. I have a kid and she's pretty awesome too. <laughs> but, um, you know, the last two years, and, and I think what's also been challenging is for harm reductionists, and for people with lived experience for the longest time we fought to like have a seat at these tables yeah. only for a pandemic to happen right and all of these issues to like i say just be exasperated or whatever the word is apology might mm -hmm. doesn't always come out right but um for all the fighting we did we finally got support and then it just came down so fast and hard with no guidance and no mentorship and you're like you're working and relying now on people who use drugs and people with lived experience and you're putting peer support specialists in positions that are really scary yeah. with not a lot of support and all of these things that just yeah. blew my mind personally and that was it was devastating and awesome all at the same moment and it's really fascinating to me to see how it's honestly gotten a little bit sterile moving forward i'm a little worried about harm reduction's future and, and how we work together with the systems that we have now for the past three years. So how we've worked with housing, how we've worked with recovery, how we've worked with prevention and just all different forms of treatment options. Um, you know, we, we saw like almost like 9-11, like we're gonna all do this together. And then, and you brought something up before it, that was really interesting. The private and the public sector came, to gay, came together like really fast and really, furiously to provide all of the support and, and now we're fumbling over who's going to get what and what funding yeah now we're right. fighting over opioid settlement money and we're fighting over x amount of funding streams and i've never seen harm reductionists preventionists treatment specialists recovery advocates more pitted at one another yes would yes. you okay would you say that um some of those tactics like were helpful i use the word sterile but like using um like uh like active um users it to Kind of be the gatekeepers or gate, gateways to to um, like exchange and, and then um, be able to change. Oh, that. yeah. I mean, syringe access. I mean, I think the principal stewards of syringe yeah. access should be people who use drugs, but I think there's a lot to be said. And I know this is like a huge conversation, yeah. so reel me in. But <laughs> peers and providers, and really any specialists, we all have to stay in our lane. Yeah. I think there's a lot of collaboration that can be done, but I've learned a lot of hard lessons as somebody who can be very blunt and very impulsive. like. I'm a peer, I'm, I'm not a doctor and I can't yeah. diagnose and I can't fix the world, right? And I think that's a heavy bag that most people in any area of caretaking feel. It's just heavy all the time. So it's taken a lot to figure out boundaries and lanes, but I think when providers and peers, like one of the best um, pilots, that, it's not the best, I've worked on a lot of cool pilots, but one in particular was a student organization and they were pharmacy students with Wingate University. And we had a pharmacy specialist and we got somebody in line with Walgreens. Long story short, for, as a peer to go and engage with a pharmacist about providing people syringes without giving them a hard time because we know what happens when people who use drugs walk into Walgreens or wherever. And student to pharmacist though, very different. Mm -hmm. And so we really started to navigate how we could have these really hard conversations, but appropriately so that people could really listen and offer it or offer really intentional uh, just guidance forward because otherwise we were just not breaking down any barriers because people who use drugs will always face bias, always. Yeah. Um, a couple of things that that brought up for me. I think that there has to be a conversation 
one about the hard things that we're talking about as far as race and things are concerned that has to keep happening so that as this money is coming down it's not forgotten and um if you're annoyed by it um you should ask yourself why um and then find someone who can tell you what's going on and what has been going on in those communities. The other thing is there has to be a simultaneous, this is the band-aid for the thing that's happening right now while we're investing in long-term wellness and solutions. And, you know, so we're, we can't just be training people to go out on the streets and fix this problem. The training should be in a, in a, a long-term sense of how, when they, change from this space do they go into providing wellness services for folks as opposed to just needle services it can't just be that one thing and then a third layer is and i, I just i hope this happens across the country as this money is coming in we're focusing on our wellness also and making sure that we are putting some of that money towards keeping ourselves healthy because if we burn out then it's just a pile of money with no one to do anything with. Um, and, and that's just something that kind of gets lost in the like, oh, it's here. We got to run. We got to do it. We have to right now. And it's like, no, this problem has been here and it's going to be here after we leave. How do we start trying to fix it long term as opposed to just right now because we're afraid the money is going to run out? You know, last week we were in Greenville. We were in Greenville and Roz joined us in Greenville. Roz. She at the end of the film, she had over 500 reversals. By last week, she was at 932 reversals. Wow. That's me, Roz. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> but the one thing Roz said that I think is important to this conversation, she said many important things <laughs> in talking about burnout and taking care of yourself. She said each one of those individuals, that's 932 individuals, and there are others along the way that did not make it. She said, But if I wake up and I go, hmm, did another reversal today. What's for dinner? It's time to check myself because it's still a really emotional thing. And if you get to that point in your work, whether it's doing a reversal or going into a classroom with a student or providing counseling, and it's eh, what's for dinner, then it may be time to work through the mindfulness pieces you were talking about, your own therapy, all those needs so that we don't burn out. I think you, you bring up a really good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three months into the pandemic, I read an article about public health and medical health professionals burning out. Mm -hmm. Three months. Yeah. We're at the beginning of year three of this. We're facing a workforce shortage that was there before the pandemic. We're facing burnout at levels we've never seen before. Right. Three months in, the burnout had hit, and here we're all still trying three years later, and we've lost a lot of professionals and a lot of individuals along the way. Yeah. So, and more, I'm sorry, just no, more no, over, I it isn't more over, it's a generational issue, too. Yeah. Um, I've had young people work with me and see me burn out and say, you know what, I'm not going to do what you do for a living. Uh -huh. um, right. And so, we want like people who care. Uh -huh we have to be careful with ourselves because we're not just doing the work we're examples of what the life is that people who do this work live and i don't want to live a life where i'm working 70 hours a week and i'm and i'm the only one there and i'm now i'm in the hospital and thinking about relapse you know there's yeah. so much yeah. that so yeah we lead by up, example yeah. i'm sorry when you bring up Roz, though um one of the things i really liked about her and the reversals is and you bring up such a good point too, because you know, with all that bias, you know, people don't, the general community members don't really acknowledge how easy it is to use a drug like naloxone and mm -hmm. to do a peer reversal. Mm -hmm. And what she was showing and what we see so often is when you know people are empowered to save somebody's lives and they're provided with the information and they're provided with the tools. They know what to do. I, you know, when we put responsibility with respect and dignity in a very mindful way back on the person to really motivate, and it doesn't mean, you know, one of the best things is any positive change. So they might not be ready for treatment, but did they wake up and open the shades? They sure did. Did mm -hmm. they brush their hair? Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. I just, I love it when we see people's skin improve. Mm -hmm. I love it when we see people smile or start to write more or start to talk more. I mean, we meet so many people who just were so, and are, for all the right reasons, it's just they don't trust you. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. 
And um, when we see them build that confidence and they do that with themselves and with their groups and communities, it's so it's so awesome. They're just honored afterwards. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of Josh and the haircuts. But go ahead. Yes. <laughs> no, I was gonna say there's like the str struggle um, for me lately is just um, and then I, I try not to focus so much on like um, like for disparities in race and, and different things, but it's um it's like affecting like the the hood if I could just be <clears throat> frank in a way that folks just aren't like prepared for or and it's not new per, it's not new per se. I mean like you know what uh, we've been saying that thing. Mm -hmm. for a while but like for example my uh, my partner is a uh, cousin like you know uh, od maybe two weeks ago and like his family's like freaking out and i'm like i i, mean, I know some resources but they're, they're like they had no idea of like people shot you know shot drugs and, and mm -hmm. things like that and so like without in north carolina too in the, in the bible belt is conservative um, it's uh there's a lot of things there's just not enough um I don't know, there's just not enough access to information. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I even struggled even knowing like some places to go to like to try to find places to guide like the family to to, to for counseling for support. Um, so, and you know, I mean, just it's it's. I don't know, I, it's just I guess it's just fresh in my head, but I'm just yeah. mm -hmm. it's, um, there's a lot of silos. There's a lot yeah. of silos. Yeah. 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 I would. Um, Add, I, I know it's Q&A time. Um, really? I would add, yeah, it is, I know, I'm fast, right? Uh, uh, you know, I would add in the sentiments of self-care, um, you know, picking up on that this has been really hard for all of us. Mm -hmm. I hear the same thing from parents. So we, our call volume has gone up a lot for parents who have young people who are struggling and they, don't know how to help or what to do, or is this a crisis or is it not? Or is this normal teenage behavior? Or how do I get my kid to reach out? How do I get him to recognize that something is wrong? How do I help? And that's heavy to carry as a parent too. And so, you know, with all these rises, um, our, our families and our parents are really struggling. And I, and I think that brings its own kind of shame that, that is, um, that is something that we all need to also be paying attention to. Um, you know, especially women have been hit really hard um, over this last couple of years. And um, mm -hmm. so the caretaking, you know, the figuring out how to connect people in ways that they need help. Moms are not known for taking care of themselves first, mm -hmm. but now it really needs to be the time that, that we are doing that. So I wanted to just make that connection between it's not just the behavioral health field i think um you know there's a lot of, of need just in in terms of parents who are still doing jane what you just said they're just in there and and not taking the time to sort of step back and go wait a minute i need to figure out how to care for myself first right now so and that role model piece is <laughs> most important there yeah. i was talking about you know folks coming behind us to do this work but I learned how to deal with stress from my parents. Mm -hmm. um, I learned how to deal with this, you know, and so my dad or my mother telling me to go take care of myself mm -hmm. when they don't know what the definition of that is, mm -hmm. right. and I'd never seen it from them, is not as valuable as them taking care of themselves and me being able to witness that. Um, it's, 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 it's super important that we are looking at our own behaviors. Yes. Like the, yeah, yeah. I, this, I know we have to wrap up, but this was the, I hired a parenting coach because my stress was spilling over so much. And as a single mother, like there's no other sounding board. And I hired a coach because I was like, I'm going to lose it. And all of these learned behaviors from my parents who are amazing, amazing, but nonetheless, like we've had impact. Obviously, you're talking to a former heroin addict. So, I mean, <laughs> It's been really challenging to navigate how to manage your own child when you're just looking at yourself because you're looking at your inner child and you're screaming with the kid, right? You just want to freak out <laughs> together. And mm -hmm. it's so cool that you brought that up because the challenge, and, and thank you, because the challenge on the actual people level, and they're not talking about it. You know, we're having these awesome conversations, yeah, but where is it going? Are you going into the home? Is it happening with your kids? Are you going into the woods with them? How, you know, how deep are you taking it? And 
for me, I mean, like, there's just, there's nothing that I wouldn't, I mean, carefully, of course, but there's just nothing that I wouldn't talk to my kid about. She's seen so much already yeah. with this pandemic and her being almost six now. I mean, that's a lot for young people to see. And it's, yeah. it's everybody. I mean, teenagers, youth, adults, young people, elderly people, it's just been hell. Yeah. It's as simple as calling, like in Mecklenburg County, if you're in Mecklenburg County and you don't know about Promise Resource Network's warm line, sometimes you just need that person to talk to. Yeah, you know, I'm having a bad day and I want to shake my kid or, you know, I've had to deal with the same situation at work because of a systems issue. You know, it can self care can be as simple as a conversation. Yeah, yeah. which is what we're doing yeah. beforehand too. like in, in the wake. It's always like the ride alongs or after some, you know, after an incident, then we'll go and see the parents and it's like, where's the, where are the resources to do that like ahead of time and mm -hmm. before like their, their kid ODs and unfortunately made it, but now you have to have this awkward conversation on the front porch of, you know. Yeah, schools, 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 get back into home visits. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Get back, I know now that we're, out of, we're getting out of the pandemic, home visits are so important because that's the visit that happens before yep. and you can make an assessment and you can offer parents tools. Yeah. I know it's hard, all of it's hard. And I know that it's like, how do I pick this up when I don't have anything to put down? But it helps. yeah, we're just, we're offering suggestions and, and sometimes we have to stop and say, what are we doing that we don't have to do anymore? that we can make space right. for these things that we know matter. Right. And that's a long and hard conversation too, but it's it's vital because we're oh, so many people at the brink. So it's not, I, I and I hate the coming in and I'm mean, like, and then you could do this and then you could do this. And then if you could do this and if they were rainbows, but um, <laughs> but there's, there, there is the, the conversation has to happen in pairs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, there's, what can we let down? What can we pick up? Uh, and if we pick, let this down and we pick this up, will we be making twice as much uh, effect as opposed to what we've been doing? And that's a scary thing, but it's important. Sorry, I know okay. you're, you're so we good at waiting for us it. to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell now when you're like, it's time for the Q&A, Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> so let's switch over to um, two questions from those of you who are with us um, on the other side of the screen. Thank you for staying with us. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you are <our> technical <laughs> difficulties. Right. The first question we have: um, the State of the Union address brings addiction and recovery to the forefront of the conversation. How does someone step into this moment and actively support the work that is being done? But there's a variety of ways. I'm, I'm a preventionist, so I'm coming at it from the prevention standpoint. Look up your local coalitions. We've got one at Center for Prevention Services here in, in Charlotte. But community coalitions are groups of people like you who are coming together to take action about the issues they see. So that's a good starting point. And I would say the we cannot um, overlook the advocacy moment that we have right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad you brought up the State of the Union from um, our audience member because that that really was a moment. I really stepped back and listened to not only did we talk about the opioid crisis, which we'd heard in previous State of the Unions, but I heard prevention, mm -hmm. I heard treatment, I heard recovery, which mm -hmm. I don't know that I've ever heard in a State of the Union. I heard youth, I heard mental health. And I heard parody all in you know 20 seconds, right? <laughs> I heard all that. And then that couples with the fact that the current budget that is being debated doubles the federal block grant, adds a recovery set aside, Finally. something we've never seen before. So how do you jump in? You make sure that you talk to your congressional rep representatives and your senators and tell them you support doubling that budget we support that set aside we would have resources and yes we'll have another discussion about the fight for those resources right <laughs> but let's get let's get them in the door because we have not seen that in this field so the first thing i would say is if you do not know who your congressional representative is apnc can help you figure that out we can get you the right links uh you can reach out to them via email you can call them same thing for your senators. I believe uh, one of your senators is really critical in that budget process. I know for a fact, so we absolutely want to make sure those phone calls happen. So this is the time, if you've never talked to a legislator, this is a great time to get your feet wet. And I would also say volunteer. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of resources. There's a lot of groups. You had mentioned PRN. Um, we have a drop-in center, which is located um, right kind of, it's off of um, Eastway, so it's north east side. Sorry, my geography is not um, catching me at my finest moment. But um, that's how we meet so many people. And that's how so many people get connected to more spaces. And that was how I even got involved in mm -hmm. grassroots advocacy when I had these same questions. I went around, I found groups that I was aligned with mm -hmm. and I got involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Joseph. Yes. How do we balance talking ugly with compassion and empathy when dealing with a loved one who is in active addiction yeah um so the story i was about to tell before the technical difficulties that i never finished telling um would have led me to this statement which is it's not about solving a problem it's about maintaining a truth and having the conversation, even if you don't want to have the conversation and having the conversation with compassion leaves the door open for when that moment of realization or that moment of change happens in that person. Um, that doesn't mean allowing people to do things in your life that is harm that are harmful to you or your loved ones or the people that you're responsible for, but um, Talking ugly is a metaphor for beautiful things that people might not want to hear, mm -hmm. right? It's not about speaking in a quote unquote ugly manner um, and understanding that them hearing that is more important than them liking you for saying it. Mm -hmm. um, and then support. There's no reason to have to go into those conversations by yourself. Right. Even if you talk to someone and they say, well, you go in and this is what you say and this is where you can tell them to go afterwards. Um, you at least know and have that information. Um, uh, and, and also there are opportunities to get people in that space to have that conversation with you. Um, but yeah, one, you're not alone. You don't have to be alone. There are services in your city to help you have those conversations. And two, the compassion is what we do to remind the folks that even though they are in a space of struggle, that they still matter. Mm -hmm. yeah, can I add something? Yes, yeah, a thousand times. <laughs> um, it's really challenging to get out of your comfort zone when it comes to talking about active addiction, especially with a loved one, but I encourage you to. Um, and it's because the same way he's saying, don't be alone is the way we encourage drug users to never use alone. And in this pandemic, mm -hmm ripped that in half too and now that we're starting to come a little bit full circle here it's so important not to impose any more shame or just any undue burden onto people who are, are clearly struggling to just cope and adapt so you may not like it and setting your own appropriate boundaries is entirely healthy and very responsible but make sure you're messaging very kind words to them. Make sure that they know they're not alone too. Make sure that if they want to keep using drugs because they don't know if they're ready for treatment yet, that there's a whole lot of support out there. Could I say something about that also? Um, <laughs> I think it's important to know that for me, when I'm scared to go into a conversation with someone that is either an active addiction or any uh, behavior that is potentially life-threatening um, that I ask myself, is it worth their life? Like, is what I'm scared to say, is that fear more important than their survival in their life, right? Um, and even if that person is not in a space to hear me at that point, it's about planting a seed, you know, yes. for when mm -hmm. they are ready Absolutely. to hear it, you know, because there are times or maybe a year down the road, they'll be like, wow, I remember what they were talking about and I didn't get it then, but I get it now, mm -hmm. I can change. It's literally that, like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. the I mean, I've, I experienced it like in, in my own life and then can you just speak a little louder? There's an oh, event sorry. started next door. It's literally that what you said, though. I mean, all I could think of was like it's sowing seeds and like are just planting like uh, little nuggets 
it worked for me. And um, that way it took some years and, and um, there were ugly words and, you know, but um, so my brother, like I, it is, 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 is I think 11 months clean to, uh, to yesterday. And, uh, oh, yeah. and, and, and I mean, it took some years of, of that, just me reminding myself like, speak kindly and then he's also you know Pisces. like there's also these things he's emotional anyway so i'm like i've got to do extra and i'm very blunt um very just straight to the point so um it was that it was like i want him to live i don't know if it's going to happen i have to make peace regardless but like what the words that i'm choosing to say you know life and death like they're in the power of like your tongue mm -hmm. sometimes and, and you're just planting seeds and so sometimes they work sometimes they don't but always just yes. approach it with you know like good waters like your good words the best okay. thing that i ever heard was death is not a teachable moment <laughs> it's just not um beautiful statement <laughs> and i just i want to put another button on that and it's um if you were angry if you were confused if you didn't know what to do if you were trying to protect somebody and you did say something that was not kind what happens is not your fault no, it's not. um if you said everything right mm -hmm. if you spoke with compassion and a life was still lost it's not your fault there's no perfect to this yeah. and if you carry that it becomes it carry that and don't try to see it um through don't try to treat that trauma don't try to let that heal then we begin another cycle mm -hmm. of trauma in a family in a generation and and that's it's so important to to get help and and mm -hmm. seek that and but know that there was no perfect way to play that moment whatever it was there was no perfect way um and you you, you have to give yourself that grace yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean that—that's the whole poem was about the five years it took me to come to that conclusion. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> I think this is a really important question, especially kind of for where we are right now. But how do we create a community where people no longer have to be resilient? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Conversations <laughs> like this. Yeah. Conversations yeah. like this. So I, said, oh, I don't even know that I, 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 I think that's a beautiful sentiment, but yeah. if life was easy, what would motivate us? Yeah. What would we be passionate about? Yeah. So it would be cool, but it would be pretty complacent. It would yeah, be, I mean, I get the, the I get the gist of the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get the gist of the question. Yeah. I, and, and if I could reword it for you, whoever you are. Um, it's not so much where resiliency is not necessary, but where we are taught resiliency as we are taught to drink water yes. and to yeah. run and walk and sing and have joy. That, that was taught and the rain was expected because we know it will because we're human, then we could avoid potentially people using dangerous things to fix the problems or try to fix themselves or ignore those problems. And so we talk about going upstream to have these conversations. The conversations with the young people upstream have to be about, yo, life is real. So we're gonna teach you about breathing and we're gonna teach you about journaling. We're gonna teach you about exercise. We're gonna teach you about this, 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 and this, and this, so that resiliency is just a part of your character and you don't try to use drugs alcohol and other things to fix problems because you have tools yep. and it can work yeah. I, I, um, I'm controversial maybe I like because so i spent a couple of weeks in cuba um recently and um you know there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff but they've 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 got a sense of that where we're in their teaching from the uh, elementary school, I mean, from like kindergarten around a lot of things. Like, so like um, LGBT is very much ingrained in um, their school systems, addiction, mm -hmm. all these things. And so they grow up um, in a community of, mm -hmm. of folks that 
that um, that prioritize that, uh, each other. Um, Acceptance and, instead of stigma. They can see signs from in kindergarten. Yeah, yeah. From kindergarten yeah. So it's in their textbooks. I mean, I brought, I brought some back with me because so I was just blown away. So I was asking mm -hmm. folks, well, how do you get the numbers? And how do you, and they're like, well, we just, we collaborate. We just yeah. work with this yeah. and that and that. And I'm just like, it sounds so simple, but in here, it just doesn't happen as much. Just a quick question for you, Joe. Sure. Were you this fly before you went to Cuba? Or <laughs> yeah. you <laughs> it's my mother's birthday, so I'm supposed to go. You know. oh. <laughs> like he walked in, and like he's the yeah. best dressed person that at one of these I've seen in a while. I'm a Jade, a preacher's kid too. I'm just, it's a lot of, it's a lot. I would also say with resilient communities, it's a lot. Like so, if you like in building a more resilient community, which is clearly like most of our missions, I hope everyone's mission. <laughs> um, when you unpack that though, and you think about what it took to build that resilience, mm -hmm. it's not something that I would ever want to lose. And to your point, it's just that lifeline that's going to keep communities thriving and alive and breathing and pulsing. And you're just going to have more passion and more fight to keep doing whatever y'all forged to do. Mm -hmm. yeah, really, it's going to mm -hmm. supersede addiction and all other stuff. You've got to be resilient in so many ways. Yeah. I love where that question brought us though. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you putting in there because <laughs> yeah. it brought us to a really cool place. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, if if you put your 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 information into the chat for that question, that it, it is a uh, a big question. Um, our our friends at the National Council, who's our we are a, a very close connection with them. We're the one hundred percent member here, so meaning our members are also members of the National Council. Um, they are tackling this. So mm -hmm. they are there's a free um, online discussion about this. It's a nation nationwide conversation called Healthy Cities. So um, if you send that in, <clears throat> I will send you that link uh, so that you can you can sit in on that. Awesome. So I'll say Jay also added in the in the chat. Um, it's more like building recovery ready communities than perhaps mm -hmm. communities where we don't have to be resilient. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I will last question. Um, oh my gosh, I accidentally minimized it. And it's a big one. <laughs> um, but can we address how the intersectionality of race, gender, and access to resources affects how people access treatment and recovery? Mm. Nope. No. <laughs> 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 over here like, yeah, hell yeah, we can talk about yeah, it. Yeah, I was talking about no, for real. Though. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm, I'm Joe, Joe, you want to jump in? I'll, I'll just jump in by saying, first and foremost, um, we have a severe lack of access to the stories of people who don't come from the places where we come from. Uh, before we can start having these serious conversations about intersectionality, we must first be willing to see the other as human. Yeah. Um, and so uh, part of that process, we think about what the next step is to that, because it's huge, but like creating and facilitating space for folks to talk about themselves and for you to learn about them and to create empathy through understanding and then connection begins the first step of that process, because it's, 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 it's divisive, just period, because it's a, power, it's, a, it's a conversation of power and struggle and what one side may have to give up and what one side has been um, not given and it brings up really hard feelings, but those feelings can be contextualized by the reality that we are trying to make the world a better place for this person who is a mother and a father or a son or a daughter. Um, so just jumping right into it and bringing out all of the terms that go with it. Um, that comes, I think that's step number two personally, and the way that I present, uh, the way I approach DEI work. Um, and then uh, I'll stop there and let someone else jump in. I think it, oh, I'm sorry. I, so I, think it, I think it's diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, but I think it's also what you started out with is human work. And I think, Lauren, earlier on, you mentioned these systems and the solar Thinking system. of it as a planet, planet solar system. And I think those silos and what label you fit in and which table you have to go to to ask for help and then you go over here and ask a different one you go over here and ask a different one 
and do you fit in this group or that group or this piece or that one? That is what allows this kind of marginalization to be pervasive, not just with one community, not just with one group of people for people who need help. And that goes, that goes across lots of marginalized groups. And so whatever the label is, the label is humans who need help right now, which for mm -hmm. me was the reframing that this movie was asking us to do in the first place. Humans need help. I'm sorry, no, I just wanna say this also, the, the, the understanding that human needs help has to also be partnered. I'm not saying you were saying this, but also needs to be partnered with the reality that different humans live different ways. Yes. Um, so you were just talking about the cultural background of that family and the fact that like it wasn't even like heroin, like there are more black people dying from opioids than any other population per capita. And so that, that idea that, that in that community, they didn't even know that was a thing that has to be understanding that my parents are from the South and both were in the military. And so you take those two cultures, Black, South, culture, military, you don't talk about your feelings. So if you love me as a human or respect me or see me as a human, the next question would be, well, what do you need as a unique individual or a member of a culture that is unique to get better? And part of that, and that is different as you were saying at the top, Appalachia, Asheville, Charlotte, those things, but even more inside of that. So that's, I think, why they, once you see the humanity, that's why that conversation is important because understanding intersectionality, what it means to be uh, gay, black, female, um, survivor of trauma, sexual assault is different than what it is and who is also dealing with addiction than it is with someone who's a white female who's dealing with addiction. Not to say that either one has an easy path ahead of them, but what you do is different. To help them. So, yeah. yeah, well, what I was going to say. You're going to get in, Joe. I mean, I don't need to. But. So, this big moment is all about grandfathering people. Up. You're talking about so many. I mean, this is like the best question. I wish we started with it. Yeah. Um, when you go back in the history of the drug war, and the history of oppression, and the history of slavery, and the history of the railroads, and everything going all the way back, we have been oppressed and siloed and caged in so many different areas. And what's happening in this moment of time, which is now, you know, probably going on, like I said, about a decade, is we're all getting grandfathered into this new age. And drug-wise, it's like an era of synthetics. And, you know, but you've got people coming up. Anyway, just generation after generation, you've got about 30 years worth of relearning right now. And my favorite quote by Alvin Toffer is, those of the... Uh, um, those, um, hold on a second, it'll come to me. The quote is, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write. It will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Mm -hmm. And it speaks so much truth in how we are all coming together across the healthcare continuum. And I also want to assure those of you who are out there that are from minority groups, that are LGBTQIA+, and for all of the stuff that historically we have not only been traumatized through our generational epidemiology and so many other things and the impact of this pandemic, the funding that's coming out right now and that has been has been very intentional around minority communities, LGBTQIA plus communities, Black communities, Hispanic, Latinx communities. The problem is we, we don't get it at this table. So raise your voice with us because we want to hear from you. And in this moment of advocacy, we need more advocates. I have this conversation day in and day out with our team about how we're being more inclusive and more diverse because you're talking about a white female-led syringe access program, right? Not everybody is going to trust that. And we're women and we bite. <laughs> it's not always fun. You know, it's just, it's tough because we're all relearning and we've just come from, we're just all so traumatized, right? Like, I, I don't even want to say it in a sense of it anyway, because it's just the reality. It's, we are just traumatized people who are coming together, who are figuring all of this out. And so please know that there is intentional pockets of money that is coming out that if you just come and volunteer and get involved and advocate along with us, maybe we have a chance of seeing these things go into the communities that are most impacted. And 
we can have those conversations around cultural competency because to both of your points before the cultures are so different and when people ask us why aren't there a lot of black members in your syringe access program well there's just not a lot of black people that want to talk about iv drug use because there's a lot of different cultural dynamics amongst the family there's a bunch of cultural dynamics among just all of the spaces we come from i'm a jewish woman and you know, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole today, but like it's very taboo and you have to be so careful and you have to be inclusive and it's not just safe for injection. It's safe for smoking, safe for consumption. <coughs> safe for consumption. That's all I'll say. Okay, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, I don't, I don't know if I can add, I would just say that it's, uh, there's so much tra there's trauma. You, I think you're right, um, and I, I definitely um, agree. There's so much trauma that's associated with so many different, um, so all of us. So it's not like that. That's a unique part, but there's just like systemic, like and um, I won't even say cultural, but just like this systemic designed, um, you know, policies and 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 things that have like literally been created to. Mm -hmm. To, to disenfranchise and to do all these things. And so like, I'm a queer, black, Afro, um, Afro like uh, Mexican, like there's all these identities that are going on, all those things that are going on in my head that's, um, you know, um, in re a recovering addict and whose parents are preachers and from the military and, and from all these things. And it's, there's so many dynamics um, and there's just not one way to, there's not one way to approach it. I agree with you. There are resources, but they're not really, um, in my experience, I mean, they're not, I've not seen them really be intentionally targeted. And I've, I've, mm -hmm. I've, I'm so glad I mentioned it because um, I would love to chat some more. Sure. Because um, so for like, there's like um, crew right here in Charlotte, mm -hmm. or, and it was Cadre when I was, was starting there. Um, and stuff and they literally have money and just can't find people so they're just like my friends are always calling me like i just need you know do you know anybody not even to, to work but like um do you know people in the, in the and it's like because nobody wants to come out um nobody you know in the, in the subcultures and some of the other genres in the LGBT community, community ballroom culture and different things like that where it's so prevalent they're not about to come out and um you know and in, in, in public, and then in certain drugs you're dealing with opioids or a meth, for, for example, you don't even want to be outside. You don't want to talk to folks. And so there's so many just different dynamics, but the lack of insurance, lack of education, lack of um, lack of humanity. And when we say human, it doesn't mean the same thing for everybody. And that's just the truth. You know, um, it just doesn't. I um, mean, I mean, no, it's cookie cutter. Wish it did. And it, and it you know, it's it's getting there, um, maybe, but, but they don't. You know, everybody doesn't see. You know, a a, a black a meth addict. You know, with the same compassion that they're going to see. You know, um, the you know the doctor's daughter who just got into his pills and now it's you know okay, it's not the same. And you um, bring up the dynamics though, which is really important. You know, I think across the board recovery, prevention, treatment, everybody has their dynamics. I have found some of the hardest, most robust dynamics in harm reduction because you're really peeling back the layers. Yeah. It's almost like Shrek when he peels back the layers of the onion and you guys just have to be willing to keep peeling. And <laughs> Shrek. cry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and cry, you have to be willing to cry, absolutely. Time. <laughs> Thank you for wrapping us yeah. up. Yeah, thank you. Like, I knew you had something to say. Yeah, for doing it. Um, I appreciate it. Um, thank you for everyone for sitting here with us, for having these conversations, yeah. and for starting these conversations. Please let this not be the last that, that we do of this. For those of you who are online with us, please fill out your survey. If you are not one to be out in the community, doing things. If you're not the person to call your legislator, fill out your survey and let us know how you want us to advocate for you. And thank you for joining. Um, we will see you again soon. And before, sorry, before we cut off, if any students need this little scan code, 
I'm going to mute the microphone, but we'll still be here for another minute. I'm about to share my screen and you can scan your little code to get credit. Um, so I'll have that up in just a moment. 